Some of the fastest cars we've ever made, Formula One cars, want to eliminate drifting at all costs. And so, their tires have coefficients of friction that go beyond one, meaning that they can accelerate past one G, which is ridiculous if you think about it, but they also are designed to maximize the downforce from the air passing over their bodies and their chassis. And when they do that, it can increase the friction on their tires, or it can increase the normal force times the coefficient of friction, which increases the frictional force, which minimizes drifting. All of this is to say that because of how well Formula One cars are engineered, the downforce can be two to three times the weight of the car, which means it's an off quoted thing, but it means that I've drawn this this way on purpose because the downforce on a Formula One car could allow that car theoretically to drive on the ceiling. The force of the air pushing up on the car as it passed through some tunnel or something that it could drive on the ceiling on would be more than the, than the weight of the car, the mass of the car times the force, uh, times the acceleration due to gravity. It's a live show. And so theoretically, if you had the correct ramp and enough run up and a long enough tunnel and ceiling and you had someone who didn't mind if a million dollar car wrecked itself, a Formula One car could drive on the ceiling. Hello, super nerds, and welcome to another edition of Because Science Live, the live companion show to Because Science, where I try to take all your comments, questions, corrections, and weird things you have to say about my hair live off the top of my head, and I'll do my best, and if I do not know an answer to something, I will punt to something that is similarly interesting, but not an actual answer to your question. I have occasional voice of the void, Nate, here with me. Nate, what do we got? From Woogie Maniac 87 Ooh. What would happen if two Death Stars fired their dev devastating lasers at each other? Oh, no. Would the lasers pass through each other? Yes. Yes, I think so. Um, but I'm not going to get too far into this laser super laser question uh, for the Death Star because there may or may not be an episode of Because Science that is exactly about something like that coming up very soon. So stay tuned. What's next? From Allison Ross, if Black Canary can scream loud enough to create damage with her voice, hmm. would she damage herself while doing it? Hmm. Would she damage herself? Well, it's kind of a weird question because humans, I don't think they can yell loud enough to reach the threshold for, um, for eardrum popping. I don't think the decibels are there. Uh, but if someone like Black Bolt or Black Canary was, uh, <laughs> here, my perfect drawing, use their mouth and uh, they emitted a sound. That sound would come out in more or less a globular, <laughs> globular, uh, a spherical fashion out in all directions. And it would come around to the ears here on the side of their head, not as much, but she would hear something as she screamed. And depending on what kind of sound energies you are talking about, that could blow out her eardrums. But I imagine that because she's a superhero with sound emitting as a superpower, that she also has something in her ears that helps mitigate that. Our ears actually respond defensively to sounds that our body judge uh, judges as too loud are, are tiny bones, the tiniest bones in your body, in your ears, they retract and make your membrane, your eardrum, more taut so that it doesn't wiggle around as much uh, due to pressure from sounds. And so uh, your, your body defensively acts against too loud sounds that, that get close to the threshold for pain. So maybe Black Canary or Black Bolt or uh, another sound superhero, Banshee, has some kind of additional mutation, additional power that protect themselves from that sound. Although that makes me think, it, it would sound different to them as well. Um, the reason why when I watch the playback of these videos and I sound different to myself, it's be, and, and whenever you hear yourself recording, you're like, oh, 
I don't like how I sound, delete it, uh, is because you actually do sound different to yourself versus when you are recorded. When you're speaking, you're not just hearing what's coming out of your mouth. You're hearing the vibrations in your skull and uh, the, the sound, of your, sound of your body and the sound of your voice being kind of filtered through the apparatus that is you. And that is how you, see, uh, how you hear yourself every day. And when you are recorded, you don't have all that additional nonsense. And so you sound a little bit different and maybe unsettling to yourself. The same is true when you take a picture of yourself. You usually see yourself as you see yourself in the mirror. That's how we see ourselves most of our lives, in a mirror, in a reflection. So we are used to that orientation of our face from the reflection. But when, you take, when someone takes a picture of you, depending on whether or not it's a selfie or a camera that flips the image, whatever, when most people take a picture of you, it's from the opposite way that you see yourself in a mirror, and so you're like, mm, I don't like the way I look in photos. So I used to say, you know, oh, I don't like the way I look in photos. Well, sorry, that's the way you look. But it's not the way you look to yourself, so I can understand that. Uh, I think I answered that. What's next? From Inferno Mall, are the dinosaurs from Amber in Jurassic Park possible? Hmm. Uh, the dinosaurs in Amber in Jurassic Park I would say are not possible. And well, that comes with a lot of caveats that we could, that we could get into. So that is, uh, I started drawing a skeleton while realizing that it's a mosquito that's supposed to be in there. Let's just say that it's, it's a mosquito. We don't make any mistakes here in the void, just happy little accidents. Uh, yeah, there we go. So the, the problem with DNA in something like amber inside of a mosquito, which that is a perfect representation of, is that it has a half-life, meaning that the DNA will degrade over time. Uh, you know, in, in, it, it will degrade you know, half as good and then another half as good over a certain number of time. Uh, that amount of time is not millions of years. It is tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, not far enough back to get to dinosaurs. So if you, even if you found dinosaur blood or genetic material inside a mosquito, inside of amber, and it was of the right time, the DNA would likely be so degraded that you wouldn't be able to reconstitute the dinosaur from it. You wouldn't have to just fill gaps with frog DNA. You would have to basically build the dinosaur from the, from the ground up. So the way that Jurassic Park portrays it isn't quite accurate. Uh, one way that scientists are thinking of getting back to dinosaurs and the, um, the scientist, Jack Horner, who Alan Grant is based on in Jurassic Park, he's working on this, working on a so-called chickenosaurus. And what you do is you take the genes of something like a chicken and you see what genetic switches you could throw so that when the chicken is born, it expresses the dinosaur-like traits it still carries as genetic history in its DNA. Could we flick enough switches so that chickens were born with teeth and dinosaur-like tails? We're looking into that right now. I think that's a more viable way of getting to dinosaurs. Um, how we're doing it with woolly mammoths is, of course, different. Woolly mammoths existed some thousands of years ago. Humans and woolly mammoths coexisted at some point, so they're not millions of years back, so we can still find their bodies with viable DNA in it. The hard part with that is that even if you create a perfect woolly mammoth genome, you have to put it into an embryo, and then you have to put that embryo into an animal that could birth that animal. So we'd have to put a woolly mammoth embryo into an elephant and hope that the elephant can birth a different species. This has actually happened before with an ibex, I believe. Um, out of a few dozen test subjects, they were able to birth an extinct animal from an extant animal, and it lived for a few minutes. This has happened. We have actually pulled an animal out of extinction and forced it back into the world through the power of science. The animal didn't make it, um, but it was an amazing proof of concept. This is what we want to try to do with woolly mammoths. It's called de-extinction, and there's a lot of great books and articles written about de-extinction and uh, whether or not we should even do it. It's a moral question and an ethical question. Are we responsible for animals that we cause their extinction? Should we bring them back? Are we morally obligated to? So not just that, also the scientific aspect, aspects. So check out de-extinction if you are interested in it. Whew! I have had a lot of coffee. What's next? From John Black, mm. 
How long could a creature the size of Godzilla actually live? Would it be able to survive its own size? Who? No idea. Uh, the the the, uh, the uh, I think the base the base level uh, the the base level explanation for all kaiju large monsters is that they have biology that would get around the problems of being a hundred meters tall. You have a circulatory system that can actually pump blood at the right pressure. You have bones that have the right cross sectional area to be strong. You have muscles that have uh, in their in their bundles that have the right cross sectional area to carry all that weight so that it wouldn't snap immediately under its own weight. It has the nerves required to take electrical signals through the body at a speed that wouldn't be like poking Godzilla's tail and then 50 seconds later it notices you. I think that is the base level assumption that kaiju have a different biology, not just taking a whale and increasing it by three times. Then it would be messed up. <laughs> Do that with any animal, it would be messed up because they evolved to be the size they are under the conditions that they are. So I think a lot of popular uh, videos and, and articles about, you know, kaiju couldn't exist. Well, that's because you're taking animals that evolved to be one size and assuming that they'd evolve to be, uh, or, or you're taking animals of one size and you're assuming, oh, if they, you just scaled them up, they would die. Well, yes, probably. But if a kaiju like Godzilla evolved to be 300 feet tall somehow, then, yes, it could happen. But again, you would have to come up with a kind of biology that we are not familiar with. Uh, materials and, and structures in the body that we have not seen before that can carry the weight and deal with the consequences of being king of monsters. Range. What's next? From Invoke Agro. Mm. I just want to know if Kyle's seen sci-fi's old Eureka show and whether or not he liked it. I haven't. I heard good things. Maybe I'll check it out. Thanks for the recommendation. What's next? From Eric Rollins. In the expanse, they keep me mentioning yes. clicks. Yes. They are a real unit of measurement, or do clicks measure distance or time? Clicks are a distance measurement, I think. I think it's like a thousand kilometers. I may be wrong on that. <laughs> it, it, I, it, I think it's military speak. So it, you know, in the expanse, which you should watch. Uh, you know, there's a lot of military lingo because you have warring, uh, you know, you have Mars in the belt and Earth. You have the military arms of those factions of human uh, arguing with each other. So a click is part of military speak and it's used to measure distance. I'm pretty sure. Someone can put that in the comments. I don't know it offhand. I know a parsec offhand isn't that good enough. <laughs> What's next? From Tanner Cook, is there a scientific possibility that zombies can exist. My, uh, any magical explanation for zombies can't happen. That's my interpretation. We don't see anything about the universe which suggests that there's something that could bring back uh, something that is dead to life for no reason. My favorite explanation for how something zombie-like could happen is uh, by a friend of mine, his name is Bradley Wojtek. He wrote a book called Do Zombies Dream of Undead Sheep? And he had a theory for the difference between fast zombies and slow zombies. And his theory was that if you had, <laughs> if you had two perfectly drawn brains, one with more damage in it from a zombie virus rather than less damage, would have more difficulty moving its limbs, uh, reasoning, doing all the things that brains do. A fast zombie would therefore have less neurological damage. And so the time that it takes something to reanimate would also play into this. So in something like uh, World War Z, you see people turn into zombies in like six seconds. Fast zombies. And that makes sense if they die and their, own, their brain is only dead for a few moments, and so there's not too much damage to the brain, so that when they reanimate, they still have most of their bodily functions. But if you are dead for a long time and then magically zombified, you would have a lot of damage to your brain as it degrades naturally into the environment, and so you might just shamble around and be dumb and not have a lot of faculty left. 
That would be a neurological difference between fast and slow zombies, which kind of fits with what we see in popular, um, in popular culture. Like uh, 28 Days Later, you turn very quickly and in, into a fast zombie. Well, that's less neurological damage. In The Walking Dead, you turn a lot more slowly or the dead just stick around and that would be a lot more neurological damage and they'd be slow and dumb. But what, what the, the one thing that makes me and the, the one thing that annoys me most about every zombie thing ever is that I've never seen, and there might be out, you can tell me in the comments, there might be one, but I've never seen any zombie anything where the characters in the story know what zombies are beforehand. Why not? Why, why can't anyone acknowledge, like, why can't anyone write some fiction that acknowledges that everyone has already heard of zombies before? If a zombie walked through the door right now in your house, You'd be like, oh, that looks like a zombie. I should probably aim for the head, not, whoa, this is gonna be a war with a letter at the end of the alphabet. Nah, you'd know. <laughs> That's my rant against zombie fiction. It's all fiction. What's next? From Ethan to Goat, is it possible to drastically slow down photons? Yeah, photons slow down all the time. Uh, light. Uh, when, uh, when people give you the figure for the speed of light, like 300,000 kilometers per second, for example, this is in a vacuum. This is with nothing in light's way. Light is at most, it's not exactly 300, whatever. Uh, <laughs> light is this fast, top speed. But in all the instances where we interact with light, there's stuff in light's way, like light and Water. No, there's stuff in light's way, like air and water. And light will slow down in different mediums. There's, a, there's an index that tells you this, how much light will slow down, and that will bend the light. That's why things going, uh, that's why, uh, imagine trying to read a book that's at the bottom of a pool. Light is go isn't going through that water in the same way. So it would make it very, very difficult to read. Or if you ever try, have you ever tried to, you know, hit something at the bottom of the pool, or you're in a pool and you're trying to grab something, light is moving through it very differently, slower, and so it changes the images that it creates for us, and uh, that's how you slow down, that's how you slow down light. Put stuff in its way, literally anything. What's next? From Silvis, made any progress with investigating the void? Uh, yeah, yeah, it doesn't, it feels I'm, I'm far away. I'm very, very far away. That's how, that's, that's as far as I've gotten since anyone last asked. I'm, I'm not here. What's next? From Radioactive Plays, how many markers does you waste in a year? How many war markers does I waste? Well, the amount of, never mind, I'm not gonna make money. Uh, I go through quite a number of these, if any, you know, company wanted to, <laughs> anyway. Uh, yeah, I go through a number of markers. Uh, I'd say maybe a package every three weeks to a month or so. So I go through a lot of ink. I'm like a printer, but with more hair. What's next? From Emmanuel Hammond. Mm. What would happen if you absorbed light instead of reflecting it? Would, it? would you be dark or light? You do absorb light. I, I mean, uh, the, um, the measure of how much something reflects light is called albedo, and the shiniest things have a very high albedo. They will reflect most of the light that touches them like a mirror or a very shiny piece of metal. Uh, they have high albedos, or the, the surface of the moon reflects a lot of the light that hits it. That's why you can see the moon so well and so brightly. Um, we, of course, absorb some light and re-emit other, or reflect and you know, bounce off some other kinds of light. And for different uh, skin tones of people, it's a different amount of light. It changes the albedo based on what wavelengths are absorbed and what aren't. Uh, so uh, I forgot what your question was, but yes, humans absorb quite a bit of light and don't re-emit or, <laughs> or reflect a lot of that back because we have a, relatively speaking, low albedo. The, the materials, I, 
I haven't been able to use this, uh, this analogy yet. The materials that absorb the most light that we know of, uh, you've probably heard of Vantablack, right? This entire place is kind of like Vantablack. But Vantablack is that material you've heard of that is the blackest black in existence. And how it works is very crudely speaking like this. You have, this is the surface that is Vantablack. And incoming light comes, comes in and instead, instead of bouncing up and out so it could hit your eye or something, it goes in and bounces around and gets trapped inside of these in these in these carbon nanotube forests, and it doesn't come back out and meet your eye. That's why Vantablack absorbs 99.9978 percent of light or whatever. And the analogy to this, uh, fellas, is in urinals. You know those little those things at the bottom of urinals that have all the spokes popping up, the splash guards. It's because when you urinate into them, instead of splashing back out at you, it goes in and ricochets down in those spokes. So Vantablack is the urinal splash guard of light technology. Put it on your website, Vantablack. What's next? From Welsh Andy T, mm. if you could bring back any extinct animal, what would it be and why? If I could bring back any extinct animal myself. Um... Growing up as a kid, I don't know why. I think it was the, I think it was the dinosaur CD-ROM, a very specific one. I can't remember what it's called. Very specific one. Oh, they're not extinct. Never mind. <laughs> I was gonna say Nautilus, Nautilus is, but they still exist. They've been around for so so long since the dinosaurs, uh, and they're beautiful, weird little creatures that have like cool chamber technology technology inside of their shells and they pump it full of water or air or not to change elevation in the water. It's really cool. But they are not extinct. Um, hmm. What would I bring back? I don't know. It's hard to say. It's hard to, it's hard to make that moral choice as, as we were talking about earlier with the extinction. The rate that we're uh, extinguishing life on this planet because of, you know, climate change and deforestation and you know the growth of the human population is like a species a day or more i think um i don't know i'd like to pet a tasmanian devil oh wait tasmanian tiger <laughs> there we go man i am not good with my animals that are actually dead what's next from daniel perez mm. what would happen if the coldest temperature possible comes in contact with the hottest temperature possible Oh, I don't know. If, if literally absolute zero touched the hottest possible temperature, absolute hot. Oh, wow. I have, I have no idea what would happen. Um, well, from what I understand, I don't think there's an upper bound on what absolute hot is. Or not as much of a bound as there is on absolute zero. We can, we can get very, very, very close to absolute zero in the lab. Like, we can get down to billionths of a Kelvin. So very, very close to absolute zero, but we're not, we're not as close to getting to absolute hot. So I imagine that if the hottest hot touched the coldest cold, the hottest hot would win because it has an upper bound that simply goes further in that direction than absolute cold. But I, I, have, I have no idea. It, it's also not, it's not a nebulous thing, right? It's not just temperature. It has to be two objects or things or, or, or you know, uh, some matter with that property. And I don't know what would happen when those two would touch. I think the coldest cold thing would evaporate very, uh, would evaporate before it even, got, it even got close to the hottest hot thing. Kind of like if you took you know, a ball of matter at absolute zero and threw it near the sun. The sun's going to win before the absolute zero. Th well, a planet made out of absolute zero material. No, and a star made out of absolute zero material. Would it go away before it got to the sun because it's, emitti it's emitting more thermal radiation? It's a good question, but I think absolute hot would win, you know, if I have to answer on the spot, which I do. What's next? From Ralph Franco. Hmm. What does a star taste like? Death. What's, oh, well, I mean, that's my fun answer. Uh, a more Carl sagan -y answer would be everything. If, uh, if, uh, if all heavy elements, the elements that make up everything that we're familiar with and that we care about, 
uh, <laughs> came from the death of large stars, then a star tastes like salt, tastes like a nice chicken. It tastes like the, the ground, <laughs> pavement, everything, especially you and death. What's next? From Justin Welsh, which original starter Pokemon would you choose? I feel like Charmander would be a real liability with a little flame on his tail the whole time. We used to think there's a, there's a legend, there used to be a legend about salamanders, like uh, areas of forest would burn down and uh, salamanders would come out and be like, well, salamanders must come from fire. You know, because humans are dumb. And uh, so we, we associate salamanders with fire, which is where I imagine Charmander, like a fire salamander, comes from. Uh, but he's so cute. I would go with Charmander. Dangerous and cute. Just like... <laughs> it sounds like my type. <laughs> What's next? All right, last one. Last question. From Diamond Shadows. Ooh. What do you think about AI? I've seen equal amounts of things that say that it's going to wipe us out and it's going to be fine. I don't know which one is going to happen. I don't think the kind of AI that will have the capability of wiping us out, so to speak, will be happening anytime soon. And I do trust the people, well, I, I do think that the people making these kinds of programs are thinking about some of the implications of creating intelligence from synthetic parts. Uh, so I don't, I'm not doomsday about it. I don't think it's gonna end civilization anytime soon, but I do think it requires the utmost caution because it could, it, it could do some of the things that uh, you hear people talking about. So, utmost caution. I don't think it's going to happen very soon, but I, I, I'm, uh, I'm cautiously optimistic that some good could come of it. And that's all the time we have for this episode of Because Science Live. Thank you so much. Since we last had a live episode here in the void, we crossed half a million subscribers, and we're doing that very quickly. Uh, so thank you so much for uh, liking and sharing and subscribing and showing it and sharing it. Um, it. It means a lot to me. This is all I do every day, and uh, it's every little bit of, of validation that I'm not, uh, not totally wrong about everything all the time is wonderful. So thank you. Have a wonderful rest of your weekend. Go back to the rest of the channel. Check out the last episode that we did about drifting, where we have some of the coolest footage that we've ever shot. Check out the last vlog. Next week, new vlog, new episode, another live show. Hit me up, and I'll see you then. And uh, be nice to each other, because this is all we got.